with inflation and the gas prices so high, I'm, I'm hearing from them they want to get back to energy independence. As the mentorship of Tom Coburn uh, taught me, if people are serious about looking for waste, fraud, and abuse, there's plenty of it in the federal government. My opponent and his dark money friends are going to lie about me. They don't want me in Washington, and they'll smear me and lie about me to keep me from being elected. I put America first and bring our manufacturing back here to the U.S. and stop relying so much on China, and we've got to secure our border. Campaign 2022, Oklahoma Votes, the U.S. House District 2 Republican Debate. Good evening and thank you for joining us for our one-hour discussion of issues important to many Oklahomans. I'm Craig Day. And I'm Lori Fulbright. Republicans will head to the polls one week from tonight to choose which candidate will advance to the general election with hopes of representing Oklahoma's 2nd Congressional District. This runoff election is between Josh Perkeen and Avery Friggs, who are joining us tonight to debate the issues. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate for having it. us. Now, Oklahoma's 2nd Congressional District includes much of the eastern part of our state, including more than 790,000 people. That seat is currently held by Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen, who will be leaving his seat to run for U.S. Senate. Before we get to the questions, let's get to know more about the candidates who hope to replace Mullen. Avery Fricks represents Oklahoma's House District 13, which includes Muskogee, Shakota, and Warner. He was elected in 2016. Fricks is from Muskogee and a graduate of the University of Oklahoma. He's married to his wife, Haley, and is a member of the Choctaw Nation. Josh Burkeen is a fourth-generation rancher who served in the Oklahoma State Senate from 2010 to 2018. Before that, he was a field representative for southeastern Oklahoma for Senator Tom Coburn. He graduated from Oklahoma State University and is a Choctaw Nation citizen. He and his wife, Casey, have four children, and they live in Cole County. And here are the general rules for tonight's debate. The candidates will have one minute and 15 seconds to respond to a question. As the moderators, we will allow rebuttal responses of up to 45 seconds at our discretion. Now, we have asked the candidates, as we do in every debate, not to interrupt each other so that we can hear their full answers. Each candidate will be allowed two minutes for a closing statement. The order of the closing statements was determined earlier this evening by a coin toss. News on 6 has an independent Washington, D.C. bureau, as you no doubt know, and it focuses on topics and issues that affect Oklahomans. So Alex Cameron will be joining us live from the bureau throughout the evening to ask the candidates some questions as well tonight. And Jonathan Cooper is standing by at our digital desk to bring us viewer questions and reaction from our virtual audience this evening. While many Oklahomans are feeling the effects of inflation, a recent News on 6 poll shows jobs and the economy of the most important issues on the minds of voters. So with fears of a recession, if you are elected, what bill or measure would you introduce or support to address inflation or the economy? We're going to begin with Mr. Fricks. Well, thank you for that question, and thank you to everyone for tuning in tonight. As we talk about the important issues that are coming up in this consequential election just a week from today, you know, inflation, as I travel all 28 counties, I hear about inflation over and over again. And we've got to get back to energy independence. People are feeling it at the gas pump. We've got to get back to drilling here in the U.S. Instead of relying on our enemies, we've got to get back to energy independence. And then the second thing we've got to do is we've got to stop paying people not to work. As I've traveled to 28 counties, i talked to small business owners, and they say they can't find anybody to work. And the people that they can find to work don't want to be on the payroll because they'll lose their government assistance. We, that, that, that system is backwards. We've got to stop incentivizing people and not to work. We've got to drill right here in the U.S., get back to energy independence, and our country's going broke. Literally, our country's going broke, and we have got to balance our budget and start prioritizing the core services of government, cutting out the waste, fraud, and abuse, and balancing our budget. I've done that at the state legislative level. Every single year I was in office, I helped pass a balanced budget. I've done that in my small businesses. Every year I have to pass a balanced budget. I've done that in my personal life. We all have to do that. Why the federal government doesn't have to do that is absolutely absurd. We've got to get a balanced budget, get back to energy independence, and stop paying people not to work. Mr. Burkeen, same question. How would you, what would you do to support, uh, uh, or what measure rather would you support to address inflation and the economy right now? Balanced budget amendment. Uh, we are a nation that is teetering on, on uh, fiscal bankruptcy. We have a $30 trillion national debt. Uh, Medicare insolvency is another issue. It's a $35 trillion hole in, in that program. That's why it's insolvent in four years. We have Social Security insolvency in another 11 years with what we owe federal employees and veterans and different trust programs we've stolen out of over the last 40 years. We owe actually $120 trillion. 
and the U.S. Treasury report said that number is 80 percent of all wealth in America. We've lost 95 percent of the dollar value since 1900. Just since 2017, we've lost 19 percent of the dollar value. And this recession is caused by runaway federal spending and people who talk about waste, fraud, and abuse, but the record does not show you that they will do what's necessary. It takes courage to cut because we are so dependent as a society on free candy. All those checks that were, were uh, spent, sent in the mail, you just paid every one of them back through inflation. All right, thank you. We're going to move on to question number two now. After hitting a high of more than $5 in June, we've seen the national average price of a gallon of gas now drop to under $4. But despite the steady drop in gas prices, a lot of Oklahomans are still struggling to fill up their cars. So energy companies are somewhat reluctant to drill more wells because of the projected decline in the use of fossil fuels. So what more can we or should we do to compel domestic oil companies to produce more oil? Mr. Burkeen, we start with you. So uh, there's a book written uh, called Restoring the Dream by Stephen Moore. It was an economic advisor to Donald Trump and to Reagan, um, endorsed by Stephen Moore. In this book, he, he talked about in 1900, 60% of all tax collection and tax spend was on the local level and only 20 percent was on the federal level and by the time we got to 1990 those numbers had flipped and 67 percent of all tax collection and spend was on the federal level and only 20 percent was on the local level well with taxes comes regulatory environment you have states right now that can actually under state purview private property california and texas share this they can they can offset uh, the drilling process within under 30 days they can they can authorize a drilling permit and we have a federal government that takes two to three years to do that. And so return power and decision making back to the states. Let the states have the ability to regulate. Let the states be able to, to let the free market be unleashed, whereas the federal government it stymies it. Mr. Mr. Briggs. You know, under President Trump, we were energy dependent. Day one in office, Joe Biden shuts down the Keystone Pipeline. And now he's not allowing drilling on our federal lands. We have got to get the federal government out of the way and allow our oil and gas companies to drill on those federal lands and uh, open up those permits entirely to allow that drilling to occur. You know, we're happy to see the, the gas prices go down slightly, but we got to still remember it's still $1.50 higher than when President Trump left office. We have got to get back to being energy independent. And we've got to make sure that the government gets out of the way. In small business, I've seen it time and time again. The more the government is involved, the worse that small businesses have to compete. Our number one competitor should not be the federal government. We've got to get small business, allow small businesses to thrive, allow our oil and gas industry to thrive. And fossil fuels are not going away. We look at what happened with the winter storm here in Oklahoma just recently. We relied on those fossil fuels. That's what kept us going. And so fossil fuels are not going away. We've got to drill here in the U.S. and stop relying on our enemies. All right, we're going to move on to our next question. The government has spent trillions of dollars on COVID relief. Many people are concerned the United States cannot keep spending at this pace. What are your thoughts on federal spending, the deficit, and fiscal matters? And we're going to start with Mr. Fricks. You know, as I mentioned before, we have got to balance our budget. We have got to do that. I've done that at the state level. I've done that in my small businesses. I've done that. We've got to get back to being a balanced budget country. The last time we had, the ba had a balanced budget by the federal government was in the 90s. You know, serving in the state house, I had to make some tough decisions. I rolled up my sleeves and I went to work to make sure we balanced our budget. And we did so in a way that, that actually cut taxes for all Oklahomans and passed a tax reform package um, that ended up actually cutting taxes for all Oklahomans. And, and now we have over $2 billion in our rainy day fund. We have got to get back to a balanced budget and that will be one of my top priorities as your next Congressman. Mr. Burkeen. So I want to correct something. My opponent uh, just said that he cut taxes. He voted 12 different times to raise taxes on Oklahomans in his time in the legislature. We were there at the same time in 2017 and 2018. His record will show you that uh, he voted 12 different times to raise taxes on Oklahomans, 2.77 billion with a B in tax increases on Oklahomans. And so it's a disingenuous answer to say that he's voted uh, for tax uh, decreases. Um, too many politicians are willing to talk about waste, fraud, and abuse. When in 2018 occurred, I was up there. I was one of only four in the Oklahoma State Senate that refused to raise taxes. And I wasn't just saying no. I had three bills that would have put $225 million on the table, cutting corporate welfare to the wind industry was one of them. 60 lobbyists fought against us on that. All three of those bills passed the full House, the full Senate. There was legislative buy-in. They refused to do the right thing. They raised your taxes, and that includes your tax at the, at the pump. 
All right, we will allow a rebuttal if yes. you would like on that, Mr. Fricks. 45 seconds, please. You know, this is a, con a continuation of the, the dark money, half-truths. You know, half-truths are full lies. I think that's something that we do agree on. And here, we've seen dark money groups. Uh, a guy out of Philadelphia is putting millions of dollars into the campaign uh, to, dis to distort my record. I'm proud of my record. I helped us pass a balanced budget, and we cut taxes for every single Oklahoman. When I went into the legislature to today, Oklahomans are paying less taxes, and I'm proud of that. Oklahoma is better off today than we were six years ago and the only ones that would disagree that are woke country or woke, woke companies and the liberal left i'm proud of my record of cutting taxes and balancing the budget my opponent he didn't balance the budget he voted against balancing the budget he voted with the democrats it's easy to talk about balancing the budget but i have a history of actually doing it mr burkeen so i didn't uh the vote was are you going to raise the taxes on oklahomans it's easy to talk about being a, a, a MAGA conservative um, but when push comes to shove while president trump was leading a tax decrease on the families of Oklahoma and all of America. Uh, my opponent had the choice. Do I raise taxes or do we look for waste, fraud, and abuse? They, they looked to raising the tax. I, had the th I authored the three bills that would have put $225 million on the table. I didn't co-author them, I authored them. They, they either passed the full House or the full Senate. One of those bills, getting rid of the corporate welfare for the wind industry, had 60 lobbyists fighting against me. Even waste has a constituency. And so you can say that you're a MAGA conservative. But when President Trump is cutting taxes and you're raising taxes, your record doesn't prove true. Okay, we appreciate those responses, but we are going to move on now so we, to make sure we get several, since each of you had a rebuttal on that. You, you can address that in your closing statements if you'd like. Our next question does come now from Alex Cameron, who is in our Independent News on 6 Washington Bureau. Alex? Lori, thanks. Earlier this month, Kansas voters soundly rejected a measure that would have taken abortion rights out of that state's constitution. Now, this came after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. It came after Governor Stitt signed the nation's strictest abortion ban into law in our state. So the question is, should states be able to decide how to handle issues like abortion, or should Washington decide for the states? We begin with Mr. Burkeen. It's both. The Constitution says we, the, the, the Declaration of Independence, which is referenced by the Constitution, at the end of the Constitution it says the year of our Lord of the Twelfth, which is a reference to the Declaration of Independence. And the Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. The Constitution hinges on the Declaration of Independence, and people, it, it, liberal ideology doesn't like that because it talks about God and it talks about securing life. And so the Constitution, as hinged on the Declaration of Independence, says that we have a right to secure the right to life on the federal level, and it should be the state doing the same thing. I have a 100% pro-life voting record. I ran the bill to uh, stop the dismemberment abortion process. It passed with Representative Pam Peterson. And this is a moral issue that has to be addressed. Innocent bloodshed, abortion is murder. Mr. Fricks. You know, let's not, not, let's, let us not forget why Roe v. Wade was overturned. It was because President Trump gave us three incredible Supreme Court pro-life justices uh, that helped us overturn Roe v. Wade. And I'm proud that Oklahoma went to work immediately as that uh, case was being overturned to make sure that Oklahoma was the most pro-life state in the nation. I was proud to help co-author several pieces of legislation and help pass several pieces of legislation that makes Oklahoma the most pro-life state in the nation. You know, I believe that life begins at the time of conception. In that mother's womb, as that baby's being formed, I believe they're forming 10 fingers, 10 toes, and I believe that that is life. And I will always stand up and speak for life, speak for the lives that can't speak for themselves. I will always stand for pro-life, whether that's at the federal level, whether at the state level, wherever God puts me, I will always stand for the right of life. The Community Food Bank of Eastern Oklahoma says Oklahoma's 2nd Congressional District now has the highest projected food insecurity rate, or one of the highest in the country, at 11.2 percent. So if elected, what would you do to address food insecurity in this part of the state? We'll start with Mr. Fricks. You know, we have a, a food shortage that's uh, quickly approaching, and, and, and we're seeing this right now as we speak. As I travel the 28 counties and I talk to farmers and ranchers all across the 28 counties, I talk to uh, generational farmers and generational 
traditional ranchers that have been in the business for generations and they just can't afford to operate anymore and they're going out of business whether that's the price of fertilizer has gone up too much whether that's the price of diesel has just gone through the roof or maybe they, they got a great cash offer from some Chinese or foreign national on their land that they could not refuse whatever the case may be all those things combined they're going out of business and we don't see new ones starting up to, to replace the ones that are leaving business. So we have a food shortage on our hands. It's only going to get worse. Uh, the liberal left in Washington, D.C., they, they want that to happen. They hate the agriculture industry. Uh, they have targeted attacks on the agriculture industry through the EPA and other environmental agencies. And they want us all to move to fake chicken and fake meat. But I'm always going to stand for our agriculture industry. That's why I'm always going to support the farm bill. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and do whatever it takes to make sure that these farmers and ranchers don't go out of business and that they stay around. And one of the best ways we can do that is getting government out of their way. Uh, as a small business owner I myself, I always know that the more government's involved, the less the small business has uh, to be able to compete on their own. We've got to get government out of the way and allow our farmers and ranchers to be successful. Mr. Burkeen. So I, uh, I am a farm and rancher. In 1998, I was state FFA president. I've ranched for over uh, 25 years. I've been in the cutting horse industry, uh, run small herd of cows. And um, you know, the greatest issue that farmers and ranchers are facing, in addition, we need rain, praying for rain. Um, the, the greatest issue is the fact that uh, a roll of barbed wire costs, uh, you know, $138. I'm talking about the good barbed wire for anybody that ranches. They know what I'm talking about. And, the, and it was uh, 10 years ago, it was only $60. And T post six dollars and and three dollars and ten years ago. Devaluation of the dollar is the greatest hindrance to any business right now. And people must understand the only reason we have devaluation of the dollar is runaway federal spending. If you'll get the federal government under control and and, and make sure that our we have a commodity based monetary supply again, we can solve a whole lot of problems. Both of you sort of addressed our next question a little bit in your answer there, so uh, we'll go ahead and ask this question, but maybe you can limit your response and we'll try to get some more topics. Agriculture, of course, one of Oklahoma's largest industries. The Oklahoma Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture estimates one in eight jobs in the state is related to agriculture, So, and it's a huge part of this district, so what would you do in Washington to help farmers and ranchers. Mr. Perkeen, we'll start with you. So you, you cut red tape. You, you, the, the government is one of your greatest hindrances. I, uh, I run a dozer excavator trucking business, started in, in 2018, Rawhide Dirt Works. And uh, it came a, a, a pouring rain, September 29th. I, I won't forget it. We just built a, a pond. It didn't stop raining for six months. It was the largest uh, uh, length of time in our nation's history. And when you're in the dirt works business and you need to work, um, you had to look for work. And so I was trying to move a dozer and excavator down into Texas. And I spent a day and a half on the phone with the Federal Motor Car Carrier Safety Administration, the Texas Comptroller, Texas Department of Public Safety. I was going to have to be IFTA compliant or, IR or IRP compliant. It was going to cost me $3,000 to run a semi. And I'm only 45 minutes south or north of the, of the Red River. And I didn't have $3,000. Two days later, five permits per dozer, five permits per excavator, and I'm limited to five jobs in Texas and we needed work in that six month period and the government was working against us. Mr. Friggs. Yeah, you know, we've got to get the government out of the way. As I mentioned, the, 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 the left, specifically Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, that liberal woke left, they have a targeted attack on the agriculture industry. We see it, it's very apparent, and they're doing it through those environmental agencies. We have got to stop that. We've got to get the government out of the way. Um, and what they're trying to do is just put more and more regulations, more and more red tape in the way, more and more environmental uh, sanctions in their way uh, so that our, our small farmers and ranchers cannot compete anymore. And it's truly an attack on the agriculture industry. And so if we, if we don't want to be eating fake chicken, we don't want to be eating fake meat, we've got to stand up and fight back on these environmental attacks. And I'm ready to do that. Our next question is about the Supreme Court rulings on tribal jurisdiction. They have led to a lot of issues between the tribes and state and federal government. So crime victims are very often caught in the middle. So what do you think should come next? Mr. Fix, we'll begin with you. You know, I'm the candidate of law and order in this race. I've been endorsed by the Oklahoma Fraternal Order of Police, as well as several sheriffs from across the district of uh, 28 counties. And as I travel all 28 counties, I always try to go and stop in and talk to the law enforcement officers, talk to the DAs, and, and ask them about the challenges. And I've heard firsthand uh, from them that, that the McGirt decision has created many challenges for them. Uh, but, you know, this can't be an us versus them sort of a battle because we're never going to get anything done if it's that way. We've got to get everybody to the table and find real solutions 
solutions to make sure everybody is has equal protection under the law. I believe that the law should be applied equally to every single Oklahoman. We've got to have equal protection under the law. But right now, if we kick it to Congress with uh, Nancy Pelosi as the leader of the House, uh, this is a, a decision that only affects Oklahoma. Only Oklahomans are affected by this. If we kick this to Congress right now under Pelosi's leadership, we're going to allow people from California and other states to be making decisions about what happens here in Oklahoma. We've got to make sure that we get the right leadership in Congress before we bring this congressional solution there and make sure that all of the Oklahoma delegation is on the same page. Everybody needs to come to the table. We've got to have equal protection under the law for all Oklahomans. Mr. Burkeen. In Atoka, Oklahoma, if you're pulled over right now um, and you are traveling 11 to 15 miles per hour over and you're a tribal citizen, you get a $95 ticket. If you're pulled over in Atoka, Oklahoma now and you're traveling 11 to 15 miles per hour over and you are not a tribal citizen, you get a $265 ticket. It's not just. The preamble, preamble of the Constitution says to establish justice. The scales of justice must be blind. Congress needs to fix this. Um, I um, am, am the only candidate in this race that is not taking money from the tribes, but I'm a Choctaw. And I made that decision many years ago because I saw too many people, whether by um, exactness or by perception, lean too much to the casino bundling that goes on with the tribes. And I want to work in humility with them, but we've got to, we've got to solve this issue because there is lawlessness in eastern Oklahoma. It's not just speeding issues. It's people being victimized, and this has to be addressed. The learned, pol learned politician uh, doesn't want to address it. Both of you gentlemen are citizens of the Choctaw Nation. Um, Kev, Governor Kevin Stead has had a somewhat strained relationship, I would say, with the uh, tribes in Oklahoma over the issues of casino gaming and criminal jurisdiction. So what do you think is being done right? And what do you think is being done less right when it comes to <laughs> fostering relationships with the tribe? Mr. Perkin, we start with you. So I, uh, I want to say you got to operate in humility. Um, I, I want to operate in humility. Uh, I, I, am, I carry a card. I'm a Choctaw. But again, I've seen way too many people because of the massive amount of campaign contributions to the bundling of the tribes that it causes people to lose doing things for the right reasons. I made a commitment years ago when I ran for the Oklahoma State Senate, um, the gentleman who I ran against, I was the first Republican to ever win in Brian Marshall, Johnston, Cole, and Toka counties. The, the gentleman I ran against as a Democrat, he was receiving a $50,000 salary in addition to being a state senator, and it wasn't a true exchange of labor. And when I got in office, when, they, when checks were mailed to me not to, to go to, to work for them as a consultant, um, I sent the checks back because I said I want to be above reproach on this issue. This is the real issue. Will you operate in humility? Will you do the right thing? Will you go in and, and, and take your, your makeup, which me being Choctaw, and try to bring healing to pain that goes back 200 years on both sides? I will. Will I love people? I will. But will I make sure that I'm above reproach, that people can, can understand that I'm doing these things because I believe they're right, not because of, of campaign considerations? Absolutely. Mr. Friggs. You know, I, again, believe that we've got to get everybody back at the table to find these solutions. We've got to get the state at the table. We've got to get the tribes at the table. Not even all the, all the tribes are on the same page. We've got to get everybody on the same page to truly address the solution. And we've got to address it for all Oklahomans. Um, we've, this is a challenge. It can be addressed. We can find solutions to this problem. But we've got to make sure that everybody is protected equally under the law, whether you're a tribal member or a non-tribal member. No matter what part of the state you're from, Everybody should have equal protection under the law. We've got to get back to that. And the only way we can do that is by getting everybody to the table and sitting down and working, finding common ground, finding solutions, and finding a compromise. And that's what I was able to do in, the, in my small businesses is every time we had a problem, I was able to find solutions to that problem. That's the same thing here. We need a solution-oriented approach. Many of our viewers are watching tonight's debate online, and News on Six's Jonathan Cooper joins us now from our digital desk with a question from viewers. Jonathan? Craig, thank you. We've, re we've received a lot of great questions from viewers through Facebook and through our text line as well, but I want to ask specifically about health care, and Maria asks this. Maria says that I'm retired and on a fixed income. Today, President Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act. As part of that bill, the federal government can now negotiate the price of expensive prescription drugs for people on Medicare and limit the monthly cost of insulin. Do you think this will help Oklahomans? Mr. Fricks, we'll begin with you. You know, as I've seen uh, them passing, uh, just because they name a bill something doesn't necessarily mean that it does what they've named the bill. You know, we saw the passing of the Affordable Care Act. They said that was going to make health insurance and health care affordable to all Americans. What did we see after the passing of that? Our health insurance costs went up, our health care costs went up, and they continue to go up 
every single month. And now they passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which is nothing but hiring more 87,000 more IRS agents to go after hardworking Oklahomans like you and I. I mean, it, it's not going to address inflation. We know that what caused inflation was more government spending. And so what did they do in this bill? They spent even more, and then they said, we're just going to title it the Inflation Reduction Act, and that's going to get rid of inflation. Absolutely. It didn't work with the, absolutely not. It didn't work with the Affordable Care Act. It's not going to work with the Inflation Reduction Act. And I'm proud to stand up and fight back on that. We've got to stand and fight back to truly get health insurance costs down. We've got to get the government out of the way. Just like I said in small business, we've got to get government out of the way. For health care, the more government's involved, the more our prices go up. Mr. Burkeen. So more government is not the solution for the health care issues. Um, 15, 20 years ago when I was working for Tom Coburn, um, he was talking about catastrophic loss insurance, high deductible policies. If you want to, to, to know the problems in healthcare, watch every time the government does something that increases the cost. In 1960, 50% of all healthcare purchases were retained, risk retention, meaning that when you bought something, you actually cared about the cost because you had part of the cost, 50% of it, that you actually paid out of pocket. Today, it's only 10%. Healthcare is one of those few purchases that we make where we're not concerned about quality and cost. Free market solutions is how we restore sanity to these runaway costs in healthcare. I'll give you one last example. I had a, a, a procedure with my wife. $500 was the cash price. We paid it. Got a bill. They didn't know we'd already paid it. $7,000 was the insurance cost. Our next question is about experience. You both come from different backgrounds. What experience, both career and life experience, do you have that you think will benefit Oklahomans? Mr. Perkin, we start with you. So I have years in the free market experience. I'm 43 years of age. Um, when I left college, I didn't, I didn't get in politics. I, I trained cutting horses for a couple of years as a non-pro. And that means that I was training fraternity prospects for sales uh, for large, small fraternities. Uh, and I was running a bulldozer in the afternoon. And uh, I was learning the heavy equipment industry. And then I went to work for Tom Coburn. I also maintained a ranch breeding business uh, within the equine industry. And then a training and sales business that I continued years after that. And then I ran for the Oklahoma State Senate. I self-term limited. I said, I'll go to, to uh, the state capitol. I'll be a true conservative. I'll come home. I left with one of the most consistent conservative voting records of anybody that I served with, third most conservative. And by the time I came home, eight years later, I came home keeping my word. Psalms 15, he swears to his own heart and will not relent. I came home and placed myself back in the free market, started another business, Rawhide Dirt Works LLC. And uh, it, when you work in the free market, you understand what people deal with. You understand the value. If you've not always just had a government job, context matters. Empathy in the free market matters. So that you would get to Washington, D.C., you really know what regulation and what the government can do and how it can punish you as, as someone trying to start a business and how it steals opportunity because of tax collection and regulation. Mr. Fricks. You know, I grew up in Muskogee, Oklahoma, working in a family construction business that my great granddad started back in 1940, and I'm proud to continue that business on today. I started another small business of my own. My wife actually owns a small business, and we continue to run those small businesses today. I'm proud of what we've been able to accomplish with those businesses. But I'm also proud to have served in the Oklahoma legislature for the last six years. When I came into the legislature, it was one of the, the toughest sessions we had seen in many years. But that small business experience allowed me uh, to roll up my sleeves and go to work and make sure that we, we found the right solutions for Oklahoma. And now Oklahomans are better off today than they were six years ago. We're the most, uh, we went from the 16th most conservative state to the 11th most conservative state because we rolled up our sleeves and we went to work. I'm proud of our record of fighting uh, to, to support Trump's agenda. You know, we, we cut taxes again on all Oklahomans. Every single one of our Oklahomans received an income tax cut. Corporations in Oklahoma received an income tax cut. I'm proud of our record. I'm proud of my experience working in the private sector and small business, and I'm proud of my service in the state legislature. Boy, a lot of money is being spent uh, from out of state on ads for this race. Why is so much money being spent on a Republican runoff election? And what do you think of the ads, both the ones targeting you and the ones targeting your opponent? Mr. Fricks? You know, I I would like to see all the dark money, outside money, out of our elections. I think it really, uh, you know, it distorts the image uh, for voters. I think everything should be coming from the candidates uh, directly. Um, but unfortunately, that's a, the law of the land here today, and that's how things operate. Um, you know, I'm proud that uh, my top contributor is myself. I'm invested in my race. I'm proud of that. 
Um, and you know, I wish that all the dark money groups would would simply uh, go away and get out of politics. You know, we see um, there's been millions upon millions of dollars that are attacking me uh, by one guy out of Philadelphia. You can you can trace back the school freedom fund. It goes back to one donor. There's only one single donor. He's out of Philadelphia. He's not even a Republican. He's a he's a never Trumper. Um, and they're tied with the Club for Growth group. Uh, and look up, I encourage you to look up Club for Growth and look what President Trump said about Club for Growth. Growth. They are anti-free uh, trade and they are a group that uh, has allowed, um, you know, uh, anti-Trump messaging. And I encourage you to look what, what Trump has said about Club for Growth and it's very scary. So um, this is political theater. It's political theater. They keep, uh, he's been told to repeat the word Trump. He's going to have to say the word Trump 12 times during this discussion tonight to match the number of times he raised your taxes. He's going to have to say the, the, the word President Trump three more times to match the number of times uh, the years that he was a Democrat. He's 28 years of age. He was a Democrat. He admitted this at the Cherokee County debate last week. He switched and ran for the Republic, Republican Party. And uh, he missed the, the uh, presidential primary in 2016. I voted for President Trump. I didn't miss the, the primary. I voted in the primary. I voted for President Trump in 16 and 20. I'm endorsed by Oklahomans for Trump. I'm endorsed by the MAGA Institute. I support President Trump's agenda. The dark money is the smears that are trying to make me look like a liberal when the truth is I'm the conservative in the race. The will allow a rebuttal. 45 seconds, Mr. Fricks. You know, those groups like Oklahomans for Trump, if you actually do your research into that, uh, the Trump campaign and the Trump organization has sent cease and desist letters time and time again to those organizations because they have no affiliation with Trump. And that's my opponent has simply uh, licked his finger, stuck in the air, tried to see what direction the wind is coming. He didn't mention Trump at all at the beginning of his campaign. And now all of a sudden he's wanting to mention Trump because some pollster told him that he needs to go out there and mention Trump. And so he's got these fake news endorsements out there. Um, you know, I'm proud of my record. Uh, we cut taxes again for all Oklahomans. A half truth is a full lie. You know that. You know that we cut taxes for every single Oklahoman. I was registered Democrat for a short period of time uh, to be able to vote in a local county election in Muskogee County. We didn't have any Republicans running for, for some local offices. And check the record. I did vote for President Trump. I did vote in that presidential election. Mr. Burkeen. And so it, it's just political theater. It's, it's designed. I voted for Trump. I supported Trump. And what's amazing is, is my opponent I spoke to him in private under biblical mandate to talk to someone in private and then address it publicly. I talked to him in private and told him he knew that this is smear about me being a never Trumper is a lie. I went to him in private and I said that to him a few days ago. You can go to my Facebook page. I was working, hustling in the free market. Go look in my, my 2019. First, I'd been on Facebook for years. One of my very first posts was Franklin Graham saying the reason why I back Trump is because he defends the Christian faith. I'd been on social media for years. They don't want to look for the truth because it doesn't fit the narrative. They are trying to get people, uninformed voters, to, to buy the lie that I'm a never Trumper because they can't talk about their record because their record is not MAGA. Their record is more like Bernie Sanders when it comes to tax policy. Right, let's stay with the issue of the attack ads for just one moment, please. So what do you think is the biggest falsehood or the biggest misconception about you that you've seen from these ads? We'll start with Mr. Burkeen. Uh, the fact that they're saying I'm a never Trumper. I supported Donald Trump. Go back and look at my personal Facebook pages. Personal Facebook. They didn't want to look for the truth. It doesn't fit their narrative. And so Exodus 18:21 says this. You shall select out of all the people, able men who fear God, men of truth. How someone campaigns is how they will legislate and how they will govern. If they're willing by their own ambition, to, when you can easily find on Facebook, the multiple times I, I posted positive things about President Trump on my personal Facebook page, and you choose to run the narrative, not just the third parties, but my opponent, it tells you something about character. Truth matters. Now, I addressed this to him in, in, in private. I'm bringing it up publicly. He knows it's not truth. Ambition will break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net, John Adams told, told us. Ambition is a disease in Washington, D.C. Ambition causes you to politically calculate and say, conscience set aside. I'm going to do what's expedient here because I need that position. And that's what they're doing. The other thing is associate me with Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton and Biden. I rank third most conservative by the OklahomaConstitution.com index, which has been rating legislators since 1979. He ranks 65th in his lifetime score. I rank third. That means there's only 34 people that, that, are, that are less conservative than he is, and half of them are Democrats. In 2017, go look at his record, OklahomaConstitution.com. He had a We're score of 10, and I had a score of 90. Okay. We're going to have to Mr. Fricks, you your response? You know, you, you got to go back and you got to look at the facts. 
Uh, there's a member of the Oklahoma House of Representatives that served alongside my opponent when my opponent was trying to push this electoral college, going away from the electoral college and moving to the popular vote. He was trying to convince his fellow colleagues. And I have a, a member that served with him that's willing to come out and make a statement that said that, that, that my opponent wasn't not, he didn't just make a bad vote, he was all the way for it. And then further, my, uh, this uh, member asked him to endorse President Trump when President Trump was first running. And my opponent told him that President Trump was too vulgar and he would never endorse him for president. And that's the facts. We have got to get back to these facts here. The fact is, is that I'm proud of my conservative record. Again, we've taken Oklahoma from the 16th to the 11th most conservative states. You may have some ratings. I've got the results of moving Oklahoma to make sure that we have conservative values. And now we're the one of the most conservative states in the nation because we rolled up our sleeves and we went to work. And I'm proud of my record, and uh, I believe that the, the facts are clear. When you've got a group like Club for Growth supporting my opponent, they are a clear never-Trump organization. They've spent millions and millions and millions of dollars against President Trump. And now they're supporting my opponent. Because from the very beginning, I have been pro-America first and pro-Trump. You, you Mr. Burkeen, we'll, you we'll let you rebut. Anybody. You notice he didn't name anybody. Represent Mike Christian. Show, show Mike Christian. And we'll release that statement oh, tonight. That's interesting. Um, I don't think that Mike Christian was, was there when President Trump was running the second time. That's interesting. He was there when he was running the first time, which is what I was referring to. All right, to. gentlemen, let's not interrupt so let each me, other. Let me, 45 let seconds me, to rebut. Yeah, let me say this. The Bible says confirmation by two or more witnesses. I'd like to find somebody else who's not biased in that conversation. I, how are you going to uh, look at my voting record and my post and say I'm a never-Trumper? Club for Growth supported as a third-party expenditure Tom Coburn. 20 years ago, Club for Growth is a 20-year organization that looks for the Freedom Caucus type members. I'm endorsed by Ted Cruz. I'm endorsed by the Freedom Caucus PAC, the House Freedom Fund. I'm endorsed by Michelle Bachman, the, the conservative congresswoman. I'm endorsed by James Dobson. This liberal smear, that, that this dark money group that you can't find but five donors, and you can't, they're a recent creation. Club for Growth is a fiscal policy organization that looks for fiscal conservatives. These lies and slanders are not based upon truth. Mr. Fritz, we'll give you time to rebut. Look, I'm from Muskogee, and I think uh, Senator Coburn was a great man. I think he did a great job. But look what he said about President Trump, too. He was never a supporter of President Trump. And you look at that tied to Club for Growth. They have never been a supporter of President Trump. Let's stop trying to run from the fact. You've said before, you support Club for Growth. You're listed on their website as a Club for Growth fellow. It's okay to support Club for Growth, but you gotta face the facts that Club, Club for Growth is a never Trump organization that's pumping millions of dollars into this race to try to defeat me because I have been pro-Trump from the very beginning. Okay, okay. I, gotta, I, gotta we're gonna, that. I gotta respond to that. What, Club for Growth seconds. donated $1.6 million to President Trump. They have had policy differences, but they are not anti-Trump. They're a fiscal policy organization that helps the Freedom Caucus type member as a third party expenditure, no coordination with the campaign, get elected. Okay. They are the stalwart conservatives. We're going to move on, gentlemen. We, we, we got a lot to cover, but you can't address this during your closing statements. So we have allowed each candidate to submit a question to ask the other. So, Mr. Burkeen, here is the question that you submitted for Mr. Fricks. After filing to run for Congress, you voted for a tax cut. Before filing for Congress, you voted over 10 different times to raise taxes on Oklahomans, including one of the largest tax increases in state history, which raised the price of the pump on gas and diesel for all Oklahomans. How can we trust you? Again, this is his question for you. How can we trust you not to raise taxes if you go to D.C. when even the American Conservative Union rates your lifetime record on taxes, budget, and spending at 28 out of 100? You know, I, as we've talked about tonight, you've got to look at our full record of serving in the state legislature. We voted for tax cuts before I ever even knew this was going to be an open seat or before my wife and I decided to pray and, and decide to get in this race. I'm proud of my record of lowering taxes for all Oklahomans. Uh, we've cut the income tax significantly on all Oklahomans, on our businesses, and now today, six years later from the time I came into office to today, Oklahomans are paying less taxes. All right, and this is uh, the question that Mr. Fricks had for Mr. Burkeen. He says, you have based your campaign on your unwavering support for the late Dr. Coburn. Dr. Coburn said this about President Trump. Donald Trump is perpetrating, perpetrating a fraud on the American people. He simply lacks the character, skills, and policy knowledge to turn his grandiose promises into reality. Put simply, Donald Trump has no plans to make America great again. He is a populist without portfolio. Those are Dr. Coburn's words. Mr. Burkeen, do you stand by Dr. Coburn's words? What year? What year? Avery, what year was that statement At made? At the very beginning. What year, Avery? 
in 2016. Oh, okay. So, um, and then President Trump surprises everybody and becomes a conservative because he makes these incredible picks in his cabinet. That's why I was champion the things he was doing is because the Make America Great Again ideology, many people thought that President Trump was going to be a populist and not be a true conservative. But when he got in office, he surprised all of us. And I was a Trump supporter. I'm a Trump fan. I think he assaulted the, uh, this political correctness. He spoke from the cuff. He wasn't memorized. He wasn't uh, 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 polished. He was authentic. And people want authenticity in government. What people don't want is people who pander for votes. And so I loved Tom Coburn. But I know also that Tom Coburn got to see in Donald Trump years later that Donald Trump was making the right decisions, making America great again, which ties into the American exceptionalism that Ronald Reagan exemplified, uh, peace through strength. Dr. Coburn was a conservative. Trump has proven he's a conservative. And so timing matters on, on comments. So we are going to head back now to our nation's capital for another question from Alex Cameron at our News on 6 Washington Bureau. Alex? Lori, thanks. You know, a lot of people think that Republicans uh, may regain the House, maybe even the Senate in November. But even if that happens, the Senate filibuster still means that most laws will still need bipartisan support, or most bills will still need bipartisan support to become law, something that you guys haven't had to worry about a whole lot at the state capitol in recent years. So the question is, can you see yourself working across the aisle, compromising with Democrats, if that's what it takes to make headway on an issue you care about, and what would such an issue be? Uh, Mr. Fricks, we begin with you. You know, I'm always willing to work with anybody who loves this country, but now we see over 90 members of Congress, last count that I heard, that go around the, the, the U.S. Capitol building wearing a pin on their lapel that says Socialist Democrat. I can never sit across the, the table. I can never work with anyone who hates this country. But anybody who loves this country, who believes that this country is the greatest country in, in the, on this planet, I'm always willing to sit down and work with them. Mr. Burkeen. So I want to say this. Uh, Representative Fricks and I have had a discussion tonight that's, that's um, I'm calling out uh, bull. <laughs> and that doesn't mean I don't care about him as an individual and want good for him. Um, I pray for Representative Fricks. I pray, I pray for, for, for people that, um, again, ambition um, can cause you to do things um, that otherwise you wouldn't do and the pressure's on. And, but we have to love people. And so the way that you influence someone is you love them. And you can have a disagreement and you still love them. And I, there's a, a quote by Charles Spurgeon that I think a lot of, and it says, for us to hate those who are in error or speak of them with contempt or wish them ill or do them wrong is not according to the spirit of Christ. And the conquering weapon of the Christian is love. Would you like to respond? Yes, 45 you know, seconds. It's uh, absolutely laughable to say that you should not have ambition uh, to run for Congress. I mean, obviously, you have ambition or you would not be here running for Congress today. Um, you know, I'm proud that I think one of the things that's wrong with our country today is that we have too many people out there that don't have ambition, that are not willing to get, off, off, get up off their couch and go to work. That's why we have a major job shortage out there. I, the only ambition that I have is I'm going to work hard in my small business every day, and my ambition in Congress is going to be to fight like heck to make sure that we fight for the America First agenda and fight for the people of the second district. I grew up in, in a hardworking family. I, everything that I have today is because of hard work, and I'm proud of that uh, work ethic, and we need more of that work ethic in Congress. Mr. Green? So, selfish ambition. Selfish ambition is what turns outsiders into insiders. Um, I learned as a state senator that the question you have to ask is when you get up there with the... Uh, the uh, bureaucracy and those that are careerist is, are you going to be on our team? Washington has been playing it safe, both parties, for the last 40 years. It's why we have a $30 trillion national debt. And ambition says, I'm going to do whatever it takes to keep my chairmanship. That's what ambition says. And you play the game, and they say, hey, if you don't play the game, you can't keep your chairmanship. And if you don't play the game, you can't get your earmark and go home and be applauded and look like you're really getting something done. That's what's losing this nation. I lost my chairman as a state senator because I refused to uh, play the game. As a state senator, I was punished by not voting to raise taxes in 2018 by a bill being taken from me. I don't play the games. 
I confront them. Ambition is what causes people to play the game in politics. One Mr. French, that's a, that's a pretty sharp jab, so I want to give you about 20 seconds to respond. You know, you talk about not playing the game, but then you look at the actions. You know, you got to look at somebody's actions. You can't just look at what they talk about. Look at his actions. He's pledged his vote to, to a caucus that, even if he doesn't agree with that caucus, of 80% of the members of that caucus, he has got to vote the way that they tell him to do. You talk about playing the game, he's already played the game. You look at the amount of national money coming in the race, there's an article that compared the amount, uh, only about $2 for every dollar my campaign has spent and about $7 for every dollar his campaign has spent. You can clear, see clearly that the national money is supporting our opponent because he's played the game, because he has worked in Washington, D.C. for years and worked for former senators and congressmen. Um, right. He is okay. playing the game, that's, clearly. That's, that's a little over 20 seconds. All right. Uh, I have 20, about yes, sir. That. 20 seconds. So I'm endorsed by the Freedom Caucus PAC, the House Freedom Fund. I'm the Freedom Caucus type member in this. I'm the conservative. That's why I'm Michelle, o Michelle, not Obama. <laughs> I had somebody say a week ago, Michelle Bachman has endorsed me. That's why Ted Cruz has endorsed me. It's why James Dobson has endorsed me. It's why FRC has endorsed me, Family, Family Research Council. It's why Jim Bridenstine has endorsed me, because I won't go play the game. It's, it's also why the Oklahoma Second Amendment Association has endorsed me. We're going to shift now. Topics. Um, hold on to those, and in your closing, you can address them. Did you get vaccinated and boosted? Do you believe COVID-19 is a serious health issue or perhaps a hoax? How do you think President Joe Biden is handling this pandemic, and does it even need to be handled? If so, what should he be doing? Mr. Burkeen, we start with you. I didn't get vaccinated. I've had COVID twice and natural immunity. I, I believe what Rand Paul has been talking about for years, that we have been making mistakes. I'll give you the, the greatest, with COVID ahead, let me give you the, the, one of the glaring examples. In, in my business, I was permitting a, uh, a shell pit, a limited use permit. I had an excavator, 44,000 pound cat excavator, and I was looking for a finished hand. This was in, in the midst of COVID. I had a, a, a person show up. I could tell by the way that they uh, moved that machine around and it could flip a quarter almost uh, with, the, with the teeth on the bucket. I knew it was a finished hand. I said, you're hired. And uh, the response was, well, I can't work for you unless you pay me in cash. And I said, you're not hired. And that's an example of under, under COVID with the type of bureaucracy and the type of ideology, we were paying people to stay at home. Twice the multiplier, twice the benefits for the unemployment. And it caused someone not to go out and want to be in the free market. We don't need to repeat the mistakes of what we did years ago. We, we printed $3 trillion. It wasn't even backed. It was just an IOU from the Fed to the Treasury. We spent $6 trillion under COVID. It was all passed on to our children. That $6 trillion was the sum total under COVID we spent of 20 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mr. Fricks. I believe in personal liberties. I never believe that we should shut down because of some sort of uh, Chinese virus that's coming into the United States. I believe if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you want to take the vaccine, take the vaccine. I believe it should be up to each, er, each and one of us to make that choice on our own because I believe in personal liberties. That's what makes the United States of America great. And I believe that the COVID-19 was simply a hoax by the left to, uh, to, to, to make sure that the Democrats won in 2020 and, uh, prepare to, uh, and make sure that that election fraud, they changed the rules at the very last minute in a lot of those states because of COVID-19. And so uh, we got to get back to personal liberties and that's what I'm always going to fight for. And part of that question was, did you get vaccinated? I did not. Did not, okay. Many Oklahomans want strong border security. What do you think should be done to improve border security? And instead of the president or the court solving the problem, why can't Congress get together and come up with a bipartisan immigration policy? Mr. Fricks, we'll start with you. You know, we have got to secure our border, and that means finishing building the wall. Uh, right now, we have enough fentanyl coming across that southern border to kill every single American seven times. I'm proud of my record in the Oklahoma legislature of always standing for law and order, standing for law enforcement. And I'll do the same thing in D.C. We've got to stand for our Border Patrol agents and make sure that we finish building that wall and we have a strong southern border. We cannot even begin to have the conversations about real immigration reform until we secure our southern border. I'm all for anybody who wants to come to this country legally, but that's the key. They've got to come here legally, and we've got to do that by securing our border, building the wall, giving our Border Patrol agents the funding that they need to make sure that they do their job. I've done that in the legislature of backing law enforcement, and we'll do that again in Congress. Mr. Burkeen. Article 4, Section 4 of the United States Constitution says we guarantee to every state a Republican form of government and to protect those states against invasion. We don't need any more laws. What President Trump did is what many people have been talking about for many years. He put 450 miles of wall up. And that should have been continued instead of laying the contractors off. 
that wall needs to be finished. Well, you cannot solve immigration until you get the wall up. And those that say the wall won't work, ask the people that put the barricade around Washington, D.C., around the Capitol, if walls don't work. If it's good enough for the goose, it's good enough for the gander. We have got to secure that border. We don't know what's coming across with terror cells. We don't know what's coming across with fentanyl. We have no idea who's coming in for nefarious purposes to do us ill. If the enemy, the, if, the, if there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can't do us harm in this nation. Okay. From cyber attacks to the growing power and influence of China to concerns about Russia, many people are concerned about the different threats to America. We want to know what you see as the biggest external threat to America and how would you address it, address it in Congress, Mr. Burkeen? This ch external is China. I, I go back to the statement I just made. If, if there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can't do us any harm. China is looking to grab hold of the, of, of, uh, the uh, international uh, commodities. They absolutely, with you on, are trying to, to go into purchasing of what is normally the petrodollar for us. They want to grab hold of the world reserve currency. They are trying to colonize around the world. China is buying up land. They're buying up companies. You got one of the major packers in, in the in the feed industry, in the cattle industry, that's owned by China. China is at economic war with us, and they are waiting for us because of our devaluation of our dollar, because of our debt loading. We're eleventh most in debt. There's 11, only 11 nations ahead of us in our debt loading. We have got to get our debt in order. 129 debt to GDP ratio means this. It means we are in trouble. We are out over our skis. It's why every family will spend $7,000 more this year than you did last year because we are devaluing your dollar, but it all goes back to federal spending. Mr. Frakes. You know, as far as which country is the biggest threat, I would definitely agree that China is a huge threat to our country right now. You know, under President Trump, he talked about putting America first and bringing those manufacturing jobs back here to the U.S. We've got to continue that. We've got to bring all those manufacturing jobs back here to the U.S. and be self-reliant. You know, just we saw with the, the car shortage, the reason why we didn't have new cars on the market is because we had a shortage of chips that were being uh, made in other countries. We've got to get all that manufacturing back here to the U.S., put America first, and be self-reliant. You know, we've also got to stop, put a stop to the, the Chinese and other groups that are coming into our country and buying up land right here in Oklahoma. Right here in Oklahoma, they're buying land every single day. We've got to make sure that we put a complete stop to that and stop allowing these other countries to buy up our land. But I believe also our, our top foreign policy issue, um, biggest threat to our country, should be securing our border. We have got to do that first and foremost, or we're going to continue to see um, our country infiltrated uh, with people coming across the southern border. It is wide open right now. And until we stand up and secure our border, um, we're going to continue to face these challenges. Before we get to the closing statements, which you, of course, will each have two minutes for, we want to ask you a quick question, so 45-second answer, if that's possible, <laughs> and we're limiting it just so we can make sure you have your closings. Um, what is something that you learned on the campaign trail? Mr. Fricks. You know, it's been great traveling all 28 counties, and I've learned from people all across the 28 counties how that much they love this country. It is absolutely incredibly, incredible to see so many people from all 28 counties talking about how much they love this country. I love this country, my granddad loves this country, my family loves this country. I knew that growing up, but to see that same love in other people from all across the 28 counties is absolutely encouraging and it gives me hope for the future of our country. Thank you for keeping it under 40 seconds. <laughs> about uh, three or four nights ago, we're driving home um, and in the Calvin area. A, a truck is rolled over, a uh, semi-truck, it's slammed on brakes, a water truck, and uh, he had run up the, the, the incline, busted the back of the window in. We were the second on the scene, and this gentleman stumbles out. Um, he looked uh, um, like he'd had enough to drink, and uh, he then made his exit in the dark as I was asking, you know, who else is in the vehicle. Um, he had tribal tags. We, we had some people that showed up. And I began to ask the deputies, we're filling out a deposition on what was going on, about their concern that you never know once these cases are handed over what happens. He told me about a child pornography case he'd handed over to the tribal courts. He had never subpoenaed on it two years ago. We have got to fix this McGirt issue. Okay, it is now time for those closing statements that we told you that we would have. We have set aside two minutes for each candidate to give, and we are going to begin closings with Mr. Fricks. Well, thank you all for tuning in tonight, and thank you for listening to us talk about these important issues that are facing our state and facing our country. You know, I want to tell you a little bit more about myself. I grew up in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Uh, my granddad started in the small business, and I worked alongside my granddad. And unfortunately, he's no longer with us. But he taught me two things that I've always kept with me in everything that I do. First and foremost, he said, is to honor God. 
In everything he did, he tried to honor God, share the gospel. He was never afraid to put God first in everything he did. Second thing he taught me was to always have a strong work ethic. He said, if you have the right work ethic and you're willing to work harder than everybody else, you can achieve anything you want to achieve. That's the American dream. And that's what I've tried to do in everything that I've done from small business to politics in my personal life is to put God first in every single thing that I do and to work harder than the rest and have that work ethic. But as I see what's happening in DC right now, that American dream is quickly being eroded. And we've got to stand up and fight for that American dream, fight to take our country back. We're not gonna have a country where we can achieve that American dream. You know, the liberals in Congress, they're wanting to redefine everything. They've redefined what a recession is. They've redefined what infrastructure is. They've redefined what a man and a woman is. We have got to get back, and now they're wanting to redefine what our country is. We've got to get back to the foundation of our country, which means putting America first and standing up for, for our small business owners, standing up for that, for that American dream, which makes our country so great. I love this country. I believe this country is the best country on our planet, but we've got to stand up and fight for our country for our next generations. I'm young, I'm fearless, I'm hardworking, I'm a great listener, and I'm ready to stand up and fight for the future of our country, and I'd be humbled to have your vote for Avery Fricks on Tuesday, August 23rd. Thank you and God bless. Mr. Mr. Burkeen. So Exodus 18:21 says, you shall select out of all the people, able men who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain, and you shall place these over them as leaders over thousands, over hundreds, over fifties, over tens. And so my campaign's operating in truth. There's not something I've put out with my authorization on this not truth that I can't look someone in the eye and say that's absolute truth. That matters. How someone campaigns is how they will govern, is how they will legislate. If ambition drives you to smear and put your own name, I'm not talking about third party groups that spend, I'm talking about your own campaign name endorsed by and you put your name on it and it's not based in full truth, it tells you something about character. And what, do you, what you've got to ask yourself is, is when nobody's watching in caucus, can you trust that person's character to do the right thing? There's a reason why I'm endorsed by Ted Cruz, Michelle Bachman, uh, James Dobson, David Barton, Jim Bridenstine, OK2A, Stephen Moore, who advised both Reagan and Trump. I'm a conservative. I didn't play the games. You don't have to worry when I get up there what I'm going to do, that I'm, I'm not going to convert from outsider status into insider status because my record tells you otherwise. Records matter. Rhetoric is cheap. Everyone's a campaign conservative. Everybody's a campaign conservative, but go look at their record. I was rated third most conservative out of everyone that I served with, oklahomaconstitution.com. Do your research. Do not listen to people that have a bias. Well, gentlemen, we want to thank you both for being here with us tonight. I know you've been incredibly busy on the campaign trail, so thank you for joining us and letting our viewers find out a little bit more about you and where you stand on the issues. And thank you for joining us tonight for this debate. We appreciate that as well. Of course, the runoff election is one week from tonight, August 23rd. The winner of this race faces the Democrat and Independent candidates on November 8th. We'll see you back here for News on 6 at 10 o'clock. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night. Good night. Come by Matthews Ford today and experience the Matthews Ford difference with our quick lane service. Tires, brakes, batteries, oil changes, you name it, and the factory trained experts at Quick Lane can handle it on your schedule. You never need an appointment. Plus, we're open in the evenings and on the